Yeah, I thought, oh, there it is. Yeah, yeah, but that's fine. It can, it can come later. Okay, just. All right, we're going to get started. Uh, good evening, everybody, to tonight's conversation on uh, investing in systems transformation, the future of food. I am delighted to welcome Richard Azarnia and Didier Tubia, who are speaking uh, tonight. Uh, my name is Maria Klusterman. I work for the Good Investors, which is a, which is a cooperative of family offices and a fund that, inve that invests together in systemic solutions for the future. I take care of all the business development and community relations. Uh, now, I'll quickly take you through the program for tonight. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Richard, who will take us through uh, the good investors and our, our theory and methodology, um, which will be followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. Then I will introduce Didier Tubia, C CEO and co-founder of Aleph Farms, um, who will take us from theory into reality. Um, and he will, that will be followed by 10 minutes of Q&A as well. The remaining time I will leave open for general questions or questions we forgot. Um, but now, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Richard Azarnia, who is co-principal of one of the founding families of The Good Investors. Richard. Hello, and thank you for coming. Um, so as, as Maria said, um, I'll give you a broad introduction to... to systems thinking and investing into systems change and, and our role within that. And that'll be, and with a, with a, with a focus, a bit of a dive into, into food systems. Always late, Nick. <laughs> um, with a dive into food systems. And, um, and then, as, as Maria said, this will be properly and heavily illustrated by Didier, Didier and, and Ala Farm. So, um, let's start with systems. Our opinion, as you can read, is that the risks that truly matter are systemic by nature and, and ultimately societal in, sc in scale. Systemic because uh, I'll give an example of a headache, right? So you have a headache and you can take an aspirin, so that takes care of the symptom, you'll stop having a headache. But if your headache was caused by a brain tumor, you'll die six months later. Without a headache, but you'll die. So what matters? The symptom or the cause, right? And we believe it's the cause. And, and why is it that it matters societally? Because the larger issues, the larger uh, problems, whether they're environmental, whether they're human, whether they're social, whether they're geopolitical, are the ones that touch all of us the most, right? Rising sea levels is gonna touch everyone across the world, regardless of country, regardless of income, etc. As, as long as you live by a coast. So we try to focus on the kind of things that address root causes that are systemic and, and at scale where, where it's possible. And a little bit of theory, not a lot, but on how systems thinking um, sees these kind of issues and how, how it seeks to address them. I just mentioned what, what, what is known, this is like an iceberg, um, and, and it's, it's meant to illustrate the fact that I just mentioned a, head, a headache, right? The event, it was an event, you have a headache, okay, fine. But this is not an isolated thing. There are elements and factors that, that, that come beneath that, from mental models through systemic structures to patterns and trends, and then ultimately that one headache that you just had. Well, hopefully it didn't actually. Um, so underneath the events are what, what are known as patterns and trends. So, for instance, if you have a brain tumor, your, your headaches might become more frequent or more painful uh, or more difficult to handle. Beneath those patterns and trends, even deeper in, in, into the iceberg, are the systemic structures that support the emergence of frequent recurrent headaches, i.e. tumors. So stress, an unhealthy environment due to all the things we, we, we know about. And then ultimately, why don't we change those things? Why are we less aware of it or less willing to make the changes that are required? And that comes down to what, what are known as mental models. Um, there may be a host of reasons. Well, well, you know, stress, yeah, life is difficult or, you know, I've got things to do or, or you know, 
yes, processed food is not great, but it's convenient, etc., etc., etc. I shouldn't be living in a polluted city, but that's what my job is. So all of these contribute to creating an entire sort of way of life, literally, system that needs to be changed, but can be changed in different ways and, and acted upon by different actors differently. And we're going to focus today on how investors can and should um, um, try to make a difference. And, and of course, the implicit assumption here is that further, the further deep, deeper you are uh, in the sources of, of, of these systems, if you change that, you have greatest leverage, but it's also the hardest to implement. And so generally, does this have a pointer? Yeah, well, yeah. So generally, um, investments, so what, what is called impact investment tends to be happening around here. It's, it's, it's more epiphenomenal, it's more linked to um, symptoms. And what we're trying to address is more around here, uh, between patterns and tense systemic structures, sometimes mental models, but that's very, very hard through investing. There are other ways of doing it. Um, right, so as investors, so now we've, from general systems thinking to investing into systems, what are we trying to do here? Um, and, and, and going back to this slide, you, this sort of patterns, trends, systemic structure, mental models can be replicated here by what we call uh, a regime or a set of socio-technical factors which relate to the iceberg you just saw. So for instance, culture is about mental models and business and industry is much more about uh, patterns, trends and the events, so the way, the way these mental models ultimately uh, manifest themselves. And, and so as investors, what we try to do is understand the current regime, understand its vulnerabilities, and then invest in niches, and niches are nothing but um, business models, technologies, um, um, ways of doing things that are, that are different, that if and when they happen to emerge, will become mainstream, displace and disrupt the existing, uh, the existing regime to create a new one. And so ultimately, it's really all we're trying to do, is, is by understanding what the current situation is, what that iceberg is, what's made, what, it, what it's made of, um, identifying the companies that can address it. So not investing in a company that, that produces aspirin, but one that maybe has cancer research or one that has developed um, uh, techniques for countering certain cancers or treating them. And then supporting them, because of course these are emergent, our, our objective, unlike again a lot of impact investing, is not to be a series C, series D, five million euro investor into a 200 million raise, which is gonna make no difference whatsoever, but really try to find these players early and in an early, they're not all early, sometimes they're unnoticed, but at the right time, at the right place, providing them the right support, not just with financing as you'll see, but other ways of supporting them as well, such that we ultimately change the system, right? Um, by the way, Maria said that 10 minutes for questions at the end of this. If some of this deserves questioning now, you can interrupt me and then I can cheat with my time allowance. Um, no interruptions. No. Um, all right. So basically, at the good investors, um, having explained how this works broadly, I, I'm now a, a word about the good investors. We essentially try to address systems by focusing primarily on uh, the, 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 the nature-based economy, the things that we as human beings all need. Um, to live, water, food, energy, and biodiversity or a healthy habitat. The rest we can pretty much do without, or they're nice to have. Um, so the way we function, we, first of all, um, you would have understood that systems change is complex, uh, and the problems and the systems we've created have happened over time, and, and have been a, a result of all of our more or less direct sort of Confluent, uh, congruence of, of our activities, of our behaviors, of our mindsets. And so any response, any solution will have to be equally collective. That's, that's the first thing to remember throughout this presentation. Um, so we at, at the Good Investors, oops, wrong button. We at the Good Investors are this, this sort of mini circle here. We're, we're made of steward families, investors, and community members. So we're collective in the sense that the steward families come together, they share sourcing, they share methodology, they share due diligence, and they ultimately vote on investments that seem interesting, and, and, and we invest as a group. Even those that voted against 
a, a, a potential investment. If, if the majority wins the day, they'll have to invest in it. So th th this concept is very central to it. We've also recently, in October, launched a fund where we allow investors in because previously we were all ex exclusively focused on steward families but realized a lot of people said, look, we like what you do, but it's complicated, we don't have the team, or we already have a team, but our process is different, could we just invest? And, and for a long time we're resistant, but realized that, yes, maybe it's a different approach to the collective, but we're missing out on potential funding and, and uh, um, therefore supporting more opportunities or more deeply supporting certain opportunities. And so we launched this fund um, that allows us to have investors on board who are also part of the community, but a bit less involved. And then last and certainly not least are the broader community members who bring to us what we cannot always uh, bring or have a sense of, which is a broader view of the world, right? Investors, families tend to have a certain profile, a certain background, a certain socioeconomic uh, upbringing and a certain view of the world. And we need to broaden and deepen that. We cannot claim to want to target societal change by staying in our, in our golden ivory, whatever you want to call them, towers. So that's, that's where we view our action and our involvement as a, as a collective. But of course, that's not enough. What we have alongside us are people who help us understand the world, who help us improve our met methodology, who help us uh, develop um, techniques or approaches and, and refine them over time because systems are complex and changing. And so we've worked with um, um, universities like MIT, a Deep Transitions Lab, which is also an academic organization, multi-university organization headed by the University of Utrecht, um, RethinkX, which is a think tank, Reimagined Futures, which does systems mapping for us, and, and TWIST, which is a field-building, ecosystemic sort of broader play because we're not in it just to have the, the best methodology. We're also in it to share that and help others. Everything we do is completely open source um, and free. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, it, there's no sort of, it's, it's not the model where you walk in the door and then afterwards you start paying. Um, and then of course it's secondary but execution partners, th th these are complex things and, and they need not be named but, but it's, it's really a group effort. Ten minutes, thank you. Um, that was the hardest bit. So, now to our process, at very high level, the first thing we do is we define the universe. We will we'll do a mapping of the system so we understand the actors and so on and so forth, and I'll show you what that looks like. And then we'll determine which parts of them are the most relevant to invest into, levers, blockages, so on and so forth, that we could help unlock. And then which ones are we most relevant to invest in? So to take energy, infrastructure is very important, energy infrastructure, but we as a family are not relevant. That's a sovereign or quasi-sovereign play. Um, and so that'll, that'll help us define the, the target investment universe. Then we assess it, so we look at the specific opportunities, and that's where the, 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 the system's lens is the sharpest, where we say, look, do they understand the system in which they function? Are they conscious of it? Uh, are they intentionally trying to change it? And then, and then beyond that, we'll say, well, what are the other ecosystemic elements that are required? Um, policy, consumer awareness, whatever that might be, and are they capable of acting upon them? If they are, we support them fully and we probably invest some extra money because they need to do policy work that a normal company doesn't usually do. Or if we feel they don't have that capability, then the next question becomes, well, what about the portfolio level? Can we build companies around them that can support each other, be complementary, and, and arrive at the at that result of helping the niche break through? Um, and if that's not enough, we will, remember, we're investors, we will consider ecosystemic intervention where we support existing plays. We're not going to build a cooperative, to take the example of, of Ala Farms, a cooperative of, of cellular uh, 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 meat uh, companies to help them um, work on policy or to help them with sourcing. But if there are such things, we'll facilitate, catalyze, and support them. And that's essentially how we work. Uh, understand the universe, find the right opportunities, support them either through complementarity through the portfolio or um, beyond portfolio activities. So I promised you a systems map. Here it is. This is our food systems map. So it, it looks complicated like this, and, and sometimes it is, but essentially it identifies in, 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 in various areas that are relevant. As you can see in the top left-hand corner, there's such a thing as the deep structure. What are the deep drivers in a given system? And in the case of, of, of our food systems, we, we then look at the more surface elements, which are around regen ag agriculture, 
this should be uh, animal proteins rather than meat consumption. Uh, we're, we're changing that. Um, technology and, and industrial food consumption, which we think are the, are the, are the major drivers. And, and just to illustrate it a bit further, I don't know if, well, there we go. So this is the deep structure. Just to give you a sense, um, what are the key drivers in the food business right now? Consolidation, the farmer's trap, which is they, they never can get out of the way they function, and that's something that a lot of the chemicals and, and so generally the, uh, the, the Syngentas and, 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 and so on and so forth of the word of the world sort of uh, use to, to keep them, the farmers within their, their perimeter. Uh, the food security issue, right? We try to industrialize food to be secure, but industrial foods, industrialized food is killing us and, and killing our land. Um, uh, the, the shift to healthy and more environmentally friendly choices, which is also happening, and the shift outside of our countries to rather damaging Western diets. So just illustrative. And, and to go a bit further into that, because uh, Didier will talk about this in a minute, the, um, um, the animal protein uh, market and system, and, and here you see uh, the various key elements. And, and what we liked about what Aleph does is that they don't try to, to, to go against the system to a degree. They understand that, for instance, people are consuming meat, that they'll consume more and more meat in time. So, so the idea is, is, is not necessarily to try to fight that, but to build an alternative that's healthier for human consumption and that's far better for the environment. As a small reminder, by the way, agriculture uses, generates one-third of our greenhouse gases, consumes 93% of fresh water in the world, and uh, is a very, very large uh, contributor to destroying arable land, as, as we all know. And the problem with animal proteins is that they generate, they supply 19% of all calories, but 70% of all the damage I just described. So, so it's very asymmetrical. And, um, but more on this in a minute from, from DDA. So just to finish off, um, I'll skip, how much time do I have, Maria? Five minutes, I've been good. Um, I won't skip this. So this is an illustration of let's call impact investing versus systemic investing. So it gives you a sense of beyond all these sort of systems maps and, and theories uh, or, or our methodology, how it works. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of people claim Tesla is a really meaningful, impactful investment. Uh, we happen to disagree. There are a host of reasons why. And, and we've tried to highlight here the Tesla example versus Coco. Coco Networks is, a, is another company that some of you might be familiar with from, from the talks we've, we've given in the past. And the CEO of Coco and founder is here also. Um, he likes basking in his glory, and um, deservedly so. And um, uh, so just quickly to identify the differences. It doesn't matter, but they're both in the energy area, right? And, and, and just to identify what's different. So for instance, in terms of change targeted, the societal issues address the catalytical potential and sort of our, our financial analysis. Again, we're investors, so ultimately these companies are made, meant to make money, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so Tesla has accelerated the adoption of, 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 of you know, electric battery, battery powered mobility solutions, but they've done that using very old technology that's extremely damaging for the, for the environment, especially when it comes to local pollution, and really essentially changing liquid source of energy into electrons. That's really all they've done, and they've displaced uh, the pollution. They've displaced it by creating a lot of localized pollution for the heavy metals and so on and so forth, and they've displaced it simply because, uh, you know, the wealthy, uh, happy supporters of Tesla that tend to live in large uh, urban areas are really happy that air is cleaner. What they don't realize is all but two countries in the world, I think, have the vast majority of their energy generated by fossil fuels. And so it's the, it's the power plant 300 kilometers away from the city that's blowing three times more um, carbon into the air. And that's, that's Tesla for you. Now, financially, yeah, they've done well because they're new, because they're basis effects, and because they're somewhat revolutionary. But, you know, should they be, have a larger market cap than all other car companies combined? I, I don't know. I'll let you judge that. Um, as far as, as, far as Coco is concerned, they came, they came at it from a very, very systemic perspective. We want to change, gre reduce greenhouse gases in Africa. 
and, and they addressed, they identified the, the cause of it. One third, the largest cause is, 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 is charcoal. 95% of charcoal is used for, for cooking. So if we address that issue and address it systemically, not by doing the most purest play and, and giving people you know, briquettes of biomass, but by saying what is systemically relevant and available. Well, unfortunately, it's a fossil fuel. It's bioethanol, but it's far, far, far cleaner than charcoal and doesn't destroy the... Sorry? No, but it... it sorry, you're right. But it generates carbon. Sorry. <laughs> you're right. It generates CO2. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Good point. No, no, you're right. Um, uh, and, and their approach, right? Tesla is super proprietary, obsessed with its quarterly results. No, you know, we want this to happen. We want this to happen fast. It's going to be through JVs. It's going to be through partnerships. So we can expand through Africa. And, and in, 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 in four years since they've launched, last year they reduced greenhouse gases for the entire country of Kenya by 10%. Um, Tesla has not reduced greenhouse gases anyway. Um, so... Now, why is this last bit important? Because, as I said earlier, we're investors. We're not in the business of policy. We're not in the business of changing people's minds. Where we can, we will, and hopefully this will, these kind of conversations will help. But ultimately, uh, we don't want to fight a losing battle. What we want is, is to get other investors to join us. And the way to do that, a bit like Didier did with Aleph, is not to say stop eating meat. He said eat meat that's better for you uh, and, and for the world. So what our, our premise is, is join us and invest with us, not because we're doing good, not because systems change matters, or you understand it, or you even care, but because we'll outperform almost any other investments you have, especially at a fund level. And the reason is simply when the risk is so high, you'd imagine the return should be high as well. So when we really disrupt something, you, you shift the goalposts, you rewrite the rules of the game, and you're not 10% better than the competition. There is no competition for a while. And DD, I remember, told us when we're doing the due diligence, says, my target for 2030, and don't correct me if I get the numbers wrong, please. My target for 2030 is 1 billion in sales. It sounds like a lot, but it's a tiny, tiny proportion of the meat market. And that's why um, you go from something that's seemingly insignificant, and, and the scale-up is just gigantic, because there are no other really good players. There are a few other players, but if you, if you identify the right investments, if you support them through your portfolio in the right manner or beyond your portfolio and, and, and bring that support for that niche to break through, then your financial performance is, is through the roof. And that's the case with Coco. And this is maybe not the most telling thing, but anyone who's invested in a fund and knows the J-curve and the J-curve effect, this is three years worth of the good investors. And of course, it's early. Because as you know, performance takes time, especially in these kind of situations. But look, and I can only let you imagine what, or hope for us, what the rest will look like. And, and that's really the key, because this is how we want people to join us, whether it's people who, who are joining us now, or ultimately, mo and almost most importantly, institutionals who will be our exits and take these companies to the really sort of the, the global scale that's required for these changes to become truly mainstream. And that's that. So thank you very much. Um, so questions, I guess. Thank you. I um, didn't really need a mic for this because uh, I want to say thank you for a great presentation. Um, I was just interested to have a little bit more explanation of the colors of the last slide. Didn't quite understand it. Oh, the colors. Uh, I think it was the years. I, I, I don't know. I have to go all the way back. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't, couldn't understand why, why some were sort of declining and then others took over. Oh, that's a good point. No, uh, okay, it's the years. I think this is. Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure what it is. I think it's just the. I think it's just the, 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 the whoever did the graphics was having fun. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Frankly, I don't. I mean, obviously, the the, the, the general. It's just to, disc to sort of illustrate the general trend. Clearly, the the ups and downs are are not right either. <laughs> it's a creative. Gra the numbers are real. I promise. <laughs> 
The rest is a little creative. Hi, um, thank you. I just had a question. You talk about systemic change, and I'm wondering about the systemic change in impact investment, because traditionally investment tends to be almost blueprinted from like a Silicon Valley approach to investment, where short-term returns or exit tend to be uh, favored, whereas sustainability investment or impact investment should be reviewed differently because the longevity of project and longevity of impact tends to be longer than your tech investment, if you want that. So are you looking at changing the system for you as well and how you look at investment and how you revise or review the systems within the investments framework as well? Or how do you see that? That's a super important and problematic, a super important question, a problematic issue, because um, of course systems change does not, as you said, occur overnight. And, and there is a gap between um, the realization. There's also a second problem is that there's a gap between the realization of your financial performance and the actual system change you're generating, right? Because depending on when you enter, when you exit, you're still on the path to, but the change hasn't really always seeped into the system fully. So, so there are two levels of, of gaps. And, and, and ultimately, if you look at the lifetime return, uh, so the IRR of your investment, you, it'll be far superior but you might have to wait a little longer at the beginning, that's true. And, and you might also, in terms of people say, well, what's the proof in the pudding? You've made some money, great, but, but can you show real change? Sometimes you have to wait even longer, right? Uh, and, and, and it's rare that a single company drives full systems change. I mean, when the printing press was invented, yeah, but how many times did that happen, right? So, so all that is true, and, and, and we're not aiming to change the system, we're just playing with a different reality. And I'll go back to the mental models issue. Why is it that returns occur in 10 years? Because people built a legal framework for that to happen, but there's no real logic to it. They could have had six. We'd now be talking about, oh, your returns are not finished within six years. That's a problem. Yeah, so, so I think that's the issue. But then to illustrate, and I'll, I'll use Coco as an example. We invested about seven years ago, so pre um, the good investors, the good investors invested in late, later rounds. We're up about 13-ish X in seven years. Now, you find me many, many private equity funds or investments that can beat that. There aren't that many. And we believe we'll have the same returns on other ones. Some will take longer. Some will be quicker. Some will exit before the systemic effect has happened. Others, you have to wait for the systemic effect, and, and the financial effect is sort of, sort of correlated to it. But from a portfolio perspective, will do far better, I think, than most standard PE funds. And that's, that's also part of that complementarity of the portfolio that we're talking about. But the system will change when maybe it realizes this is a better approach. But yeah, we're maybe by giving the example, we're aiming to change the system, yes. Any other questions? More time for Didier. I was just going to say, time for Didier. <laughs> Um, I just have a technical question. Do I need to change the slide here then? <laughs> no, maybe what I'll say, um, do you, I'll introduce Didier then. Yeah. So, so you saw our food mapping and, and we, we identified three areas in the, in the food system that needed a deep change. And, and the way we looked at it to simplify is where is it most asymmetrical and, and where can our effect be the greatest? And, and there are three areas we identified. One is waste. So one third of all resources in the world used for agriculture, including those absurd amounts of water and greenhouse gases, go to waste. So there, the, 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 of course, the relationship is super asymmetrical. Any bit of waste you, you avoid, uh, you have a direct effect on 100% of the resources you used. Um, the other is regenerative uh, agriculture, mostly soil because soil has many, many valuable effects, be it on, on greenhouse gas absorption, be it on, on water, and be it on the quality of the food we eat, and human health, et cetera, and biodiversity. So that was the second one. And then uh, to, to the last one, which is the, the, the protein, as, as I said, for 19% of the calories, we have about 70% of the resources, and it's the fastest growing area because of this adoption of Western diets. So that made also a lot of sense. Then we started looking at that, and we've built now a, a, a sub-portfolio 
of, of investments around animal proteins, one of which, and probably the most revolutionary of which, is, is uh, Aleph Farms, and, and here is DDA CEO and co-founder. Thank you, Richard. Thanks to the good investors for having me tonight, and to thanks to the Conduit for hosting us. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, the, um, the impact of the food system on our lives today, but also on uh, uh, different approaches which we might implement in order to um, get back into balance with our natural resources on one hand, but also provide more food security for the generations to come. Aleph Farms is a um, pioneer in, in what we call cellular agriculture. Cellular agriculture is a new way to make animal products from uh, cultivating the cells of the animal. As you know, animals, same, same as ourselves, are made of cells, which are the building blocks of life. When we eat, we eat cells, actually. So that's you know, an integral part of our, of our diet today. And uh, uh, we, we are uh, uh, developing systems for making animal products from directly growing and maturing the cells instead of farming the whole animal. That's called um, cellular agriculture. And the first application of our uh, platform is in uh, uh, the field of uh, cultivated meat. And I'll explain a little bit what it is about. Mm. Okay, cool. So in terms of uh, framing the issue, and again, uh, we've, uh, we've had uh, the hints uh, with the, uh, uh, precedent, uh, the, the previous presentation by, by Richard. Um, I think that the, the key here is the, the number 1.7. Uh, today, as a human species on Earth, we are using the resources of 1.7 planets, meaning that we are actively depleting the natural resources which we rely on to um, manage our day-to-day -day activities and to thrive as a, um, as a living um, entity on a, in our uh, ecosystem. The food system is one of the primary drivers of this overuse of resources, both in terms of uh, um, uh, land use um, and uh, loss of biodiversity, and also deforestation, especially for animal production, um, is uh, responsible for uh, the uh, quasi uh, totality, very large majority of uh, freshwater withdrawals, but also responsible for um, the food system as a whole, 34% of our global uh, greenhouse gas emitted, including waste, by the way. Transportation is a small part of it, interestingly. And uh, livestock and, and animal production um, is uh, um, a major uh, driver of uh, climate change. Animal production per itself is responsible for close to 15% of our greenhouse gases emitted every year. And livestock, meaning large animals, alone uh, for close to 8%. The, the, the concept of cellular agriculture is to find alternative ways to, to deliver, alternative ways to make animal products in order to optimize the system as a whole. And I'll explain in a minute. The idea is not necessarily to um, make meat conventional meat obsolete, but rather to diversify the sources of our animal products uh, with new production systems. Uh, we actually combine two uh, familiar building blocks. On one hand, um, the same components which make our steak today. A steak is a muscle tissue made of uh, um, muscle fibers, uh, um, adipocyte, fat cells, connective tissue, which are all cells. So we use actually natural cells, non genetically engineered, not immortalized, meaning not, not modified, the same cells which we use to eat today. And we apply the cells to um, cell culture techniques, which are actually the oldest food technology in the world. Uh, if you think about it, uh, wine is uh, uh, based on fermentation. Fermentation is cell culture, the culture of uh, uh, of yeast, which are unicellular organisms in a medium, which is uh, grape juice. Um, the production of beer, of uh, uh, cheese, yogurt, all rely on cell culture of uh, uh, microorganisms or unicellular organisms, um, a, a, a cell which is actually the organism. In, in our case, we apply the same uh, cell culture approach to animal cells, which is the innovation, meaning the 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 novelty is in the combination of uh, those two uh, familiar building blocks rather than in the essence of the product itself. Okay. 
Okay, cool. Yes, sorry. Okay, so we, we do see cell cultivation, I see. Yeah. <laughs> okay, easier like that. <laughs> we do see cell cultivation as a, a biomanufacturing platform, a part of uh, what we call the bioeconomy. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, this term. Actually, we see um, a wider movement in the global economy today to rely more and more on living uh, um, systems to make products, and not only in food, um, the, the production of, uh, um, of uh, uh, new materials from all cells which are from a beef origin can apply into a range of different industries, um, including biomaterials. We make collagen from our cells. Uh, we can make fats for a range of applications. And the first application which we are uh, delivering to the market, which is the only one we intend to really uh, develop from A to Z as an end product, is in the uh, field of cultivated meat. We do see cells as a new source of, um, of uh, uh, food from, uh, uh, from animals. And if you think about it, eating cells per se is much less um, weird than uh, drinking milk. And I want to explain why, because you know we, we've been uh, eating meat for two point I don't know four million years, very long time. Uh, we started to eat meat much more widely 600, 700 years ago when we started cooking the meat, which improved the availability of the nutrition in meat. And actually, yesterday morning, uh, maybe six thousand years ago, we started uh, drinking milk when we domesticate animals, which is a tiny lapse of time in comparison to our history for eating meat. And drinking milk was a new source of food from animals, which was um, very strange because we're actually the only um, um, species drinking milk from another species. You don't see elephants drinking milk from, from cows. <laughs> <laughs> or, I don't know, um, mice uh, uh, drinking milk from a um, from uh, um, cats, uh, we, well, we, we drink milk from cows. Um, second, we're the only species where adults drink milk. In other species in, in, in the um, animal realm, you can see adults drinking milk. So drinking milk is really weird. On the other hand, eating cells is already part of our diet. So it's a natural evolution of the food we eat today. We do see um, this new source of animal products as a complement to meat and milk, and uh, we see uh, the farming of cells or, or cell cultivation as a way to optimize the overall animal farming system. Uh, we do need animals in a balanced system. Animals ha have a role for regenerating the soil and for the nitrogen and carbon cycle in nature. But we need actually much less animals than what we, um, that we have today on our planet. We're slaughtering tens of billions of animals a year, and the planet is then literally collapsing under the load of those animals. We believe that we need to um, go back toward regenerative agriculture, um, toward uh, um, precision uh, uh, farming, um, and better manage our resources with conventional agriculture. The issue is that in the food system, we have actually two types of uh, foods. We have uh, plants, crops, and we have animals. Uh, regenerative agriculture is a great solution for, uh, for plants, for crops, fruits, vegetables, and there are good uh, uh, first successes with implementing those, uh, those practices. However, regenerative agriculture, which is about um, uh, restoring the soil and getting back into uh, this uh, cycle of uh, uh, natural um, uh, and management of resources cannot deliver the quantity of meat we need as a species. And a cow and a cattle in the regenerative framework needs tens uh, of times between 50 and 80 times more land than in a concentrated operation for animal farming. So if we move back uh, toward more extensive regenerative agricultural frameworks, we need to complement regenerative egg and precision farming with new production systems for animal products in order to keep the production steady and feed the world. And this is where our solution comes into play. 
There are other solutions which could also fit this approach of uh, complementary proteins. We prefer the term complementary proteins over alternative proteins because we believe that it, it, it conveys better the system-based approach. We're talking about uh, also um, uh, new fermentation-based products like precision fermentation, biomass, uh, mycelium, it can be insect protein, uh, maybe algae-based uh, proteins as well as a new production systems. So we'll elaborate a little bit more on, on cells and our first uh, application. So what is cultivated meat? So as I said, it's one application of our cells, which we source from a healthy uh, animal. We test those cells thoroughly for any potential safety issues. We ensure that the cells are 100% clean. Then, <coughs> then we uh, directly feed the cells with what we call a growth medium, which is, if you'd like, a kind of a synthetic blood. You know, in the body of the animal, the cells are fed by the, by the blood, which is you know, bringing all the nutrients to the organs and, and feeding the, the cells in the organs. In our case, we grow the cells in a controlled environment outside the animal and we directly feed the cells with the blood-like uh, solution, which has no animal components. When we get, when we get the, the required uh, mass of cells, we're able to implement them with a, into a structure which we call a, a scaffold in the jargon of the industry, which is a kind of a matrix, which is a plant-based matrix. Our first product is actually a hybrid, plant and animal. And then we can uh, um, 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 implement the, the final processing and packaging of the product. So the, the concept is relatively uh, simple. Technically, we build back, um, the, we, we build the, the meat for the, from the ground up, from its uh, components, if you'd like. Cultivated meat has been uh, proven to, to have the potential for a 94% reduction in, uh, in pollution, uh, which is uh, the particulates in, in the air. Um, 90% reduction in land use, 92% reduction in greenhouse uh, gas em emissions, especially by uh, removing methane, which, is a, which has a warming potential up to 80 times more than uh, uh, carbon dioxide, as you might know. And the only way, by the way, to have a, a short-term impact on climate change and reverse climate change is to reduce methane and not carbon. Um, I actually published with uh, the Tony Blair Institute in the UK uh, an op-ed on that uh, a couple of years ago, you're invited to look, at, to look at it. We have also a much more efficient feed conversion uh, ratio, uh, ratio. Actually, in the current optimized process we have, we need uh, 1.4 gram of input in our uh, system to get one gram of, uh, of cells. While with the beef, we're focusing on cattle, 26 grams of inputs are required to make, to make one gram of beef. So you can think about the, the improvement in efficiencies and the, the reduction of resources required to make, uh, to make animal proteins. Um, and of course, the impact is also on the uh, ability to decentralize and diversify the food system for more food security. Ale Farms is the only company in this space to be uh, committed to be a net, net zero by 2025. So one and two, and by 2030, uh, scope uh, three, and working with a range of, uh, of partners, including NG for our uh, renewable energy uh, infrastructure. We're the only company in the space again, in the uh, whole cellular agriculture industry, which published uh, um, an impact report last year for year 22, and we're really setting the standards in terms of, um, of uh, uh, the vision for an integrated and sustainable food system. Um, talking a little bit about our approach uh, to the market um, and uh, uh, back to the um, uh, transformative approach which uh, Richard has developed, I think that the, you know, the, the way we look at uh, cultivated meat into the market is as a new category within animal proteins. We like to see it as a, as a diversification of choices and cultivated, cultivated meat might completely replace meat in 50 or 100 years. It will take time. The, the meat industry, the an animal protein industry is 1.8 trillion dollar industry. Um, we, we saw the example of uh, Tesla before on the, the pros and cons. Um, you know, the automotive industry is also very large and you know, it, it took maybe, I don't know, 15, 20 years for the electric vehicles to get to maybe 15% market share today. And, and, uh, and that's huge and quick. 
Uh, we believe that cultivated meat will also take time to get to significant market share because it takes time to scale up uh, transformative technologies and because of the market itself is huge. When we're talking about getting to $1 billion in revenues within less than 10 years, it's exactly 0.0% of global market share. <laughs> so it's, it's difficult, it takes time. Um, of course, we'd like to get more than to more than billion dollar over time, but we need an ecosystem and, and the whole um, whole industry to support this effort. Uh, we're today one of uh, four companies in the world which have uh, market clearances for uh, uh, cultivated meat, and, and we count on more uh, being active in the in the market. So that being said, because it will take time, and uh, uh, we need to uh, accelerate this this movement, we believe that the right way to uh, disrupt this. Uh, um, animal protein sector is from the top down. It will take time to build um, capacities large enough to reach significant global market share. So when we have smaller quantities, the um, initial production cost will be higher and it will go down with economies of scale. So our approach is to differentiate our product to drive acceptance through um, a unique value proposition and a unique, unique set of attributes Little bit same as a, a Tesla at the time was attractive as a product itself, not just because it was electric and was uh, differentiated, longer uh, time to, to charge versus refueling, um, maybe shorter range, but better acceleration and different um, uh, driving experience. We believe cultivated meat should implement a um, relatively similar approach to uh, drive uh, this transition rather than being introduced as a Me Too product and um, competing on price. This is a project we've done with the uh, Harvard Business School, working with the uh, uh, Columbia Business School, with the uh, uh, MIT, with Wharton, and um, in France with the uh, HSA, with the OSCP, and um, in the UK, no universities so far, actually, but uh, we, we like working very much with universities. So uh, to explain a little bit what I meant regarding uh, building a new category as a, as an, uh, as a go to market strategy, we have uh, spent a lot of time uh, developing a unique value proposition both for direct customers, which are the restaurants and food service players, and for the end users, for the diners like you and me. And we believe that uh, uh, people will want to buy this product because it's bringing to them a unique value and not as a fake thing. People don't want to pay more for a fake anything. And people want to pay more because they, they get the value for what they, they pay. Um, and that's uh, very important. Um, by the way, we have uh, zero trim and food waste with this product, which is also addressing uh, the other category uh, which has been mentioned before of uh, food waste. But it's a uh, <coughs> consistent quality, always juicy, high in protein, low in fat and calorie, easy to cook. It's uh, 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 customized, uh, meaning that we can uh, um, have a, um, a dedicated, customized approach to our customers. It's standardizing. It's standardized. Uh, we can uh, um, uh, have a, a predictable um, uh, supply and price, which is an issue, especially in the food service sector. And we believe that all those benefits will make uh, uh, this category as uh, successful. Um, I have here um, a sample of, of our product just to show you. Our first product is a thin cut of a beef uh, steak, like a slice. And it looks like that, like that. And if you'd like, you can uh, just uh, pass it uh, through. We're working on a range of products. This is uh, the first uh, one which has been approved. We also have uh, in our pipeline uh, a thick steak. This one is primarily intended for, for Asian uh, food, uh, um, food culture and culinary approach, which is uh, actually um, usually eating meat in the form of slices. If you think about um, Kobe beef or a, a hot pot, a Korean barbecue, um, and, uh, and the like, and shabu shabu. We have a thicker stack. We also have other platforms, not really on scaffold, but on 3D printing. So we're intending to build a, a wide range. The, this product strategy is developed with uh, leading chefs and uh, with uh, Olivier Metzger, who is a world-renowned um, butcher and uh, delivering meat to Michelin star restaurants all over the world and to the King of Morocco and the Prince of Monaco and many other people. <coughs> 
the feedback is great. Again, you can see here uh, more pictures, and uh, we've done a lot of work optimizing the product to make sure that when we launch, we're not just successful at launch, but also post-launch and can show traction. Um, <coughs> some uh, data are getting the UK, because we're here in the UK. Uh, we see that uh, the vast majority of the population is actually open to uh, try cultivated meat, 60%. Um, and actually, the acceptance is driven primarily by the younger generation, uh, like uh, Gen Z. We've been quite involved in the UK in the last few years. We've been part of the Earthshot Prize with uh, Prince William and David Attenborough on the BBC, if you've seen it. Um, we, we've been uh, um, involved in, in policy making um, in the UK. Uh, we've uh, um, actually we've been the first uh, uh, cellular agriculture company and cultivated meat company to file a um, regulatory dossier with the FSA. Uh, which we uh, just met again uh, today, and we're leading the, the chart here. Uh, we've, we've been also involved in uh, some research projects um, which have been funded by, by the government. So just to summarize, Aleph Farms within this category of cultivated meat, first application of, uh, of ourselves, um, is one of the few leaders today with a highly differentiated platform de-risk regulation, different product strategy, focus on starting with high value and um, high impact products and moving progressively mainstream. Think uh, Tesla, uh, you know, model S, Y, and then three and, uh, and down in terms of uh, product strategy. And we're focusing a lot on de-risking or scale up both on the uh, production side and on the, the demand. We have today uh, seven global corporate partners, including Corgill, the largest food company in the world and the largest private company in the US, Mitsubishi in, um, in uh, Japan, uh, plus uh, Thai Union, CJ, Migros, uh, um, uh, Strauss, um, and the like. We raised so far $140 million, um, uh, fluctuated, and uh, the good investors were actually part of uh, the SEF we had uh, a year ago. Um, and we have, uh, were supported today by three states, um, including two sovereign wealth funds, Temasek, uh, which is sovereign wealth fund from uh, Singapore, and ADQ from, uh, from the UAE. <coughs> Just to, to summarize, I wanted to, to say that you know the, the food system today is facing, in my views, two main issues. One is uh, environmental impact, and uh, um, and this uh, uh, this really uh, many times underestimated. We we have the preconceived ideas that to that to solve climate change, we need to switch to electric vehicles and electrify uh, transportation and move to renewable energies. But it's not the case. It will not help with the short-term uh, climate change issues. It's just carbon, by the way. Um, the bigger impact on uh, climate and environment is from the food system. And only through the food system we can drive immediate change in climate through reduction in methane. And the other aspect which is important, which I haven't developed too much here, but I'm happy to talk about that during the Q&A, is uh, food security. Uh, today our food system is uh, hyper-centralized and very concentrated. And in order to, um, to provide more secure nutrition for the future generations, we really need to diversify and uh, um, find the right balance between centralization and uh, localization of our food system, which is what we um, provide as well. So thanks for your attention, and uh, happy to answer any questions you might have. I will go around. Yes. Sorry. Uh, uh, is it more like a thing in Asia than in Europe or the US, or has she start off there? I mean, given what is winning on the issues at the moment, like the euro? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. We decided uh, um, maybe two years ago, uh, second half of 2022, to focus on uh, uh, the Middle East and Asia as initial, initial geographies um, for a couple of reasons. First, because um, the major part of the beef in those regions is imported. In the Middle East, it's uh, over 90%. In Asia, starting with Singapore, for instance, it's uh, 100%. <laughs> Other countries, even China imports over 50% of its beef, and Japan, uh, 65%. Um, and I think that there are some real food sovereignty and food security issues in those regions, and a real need um, uh, perceived and, and actually um, um, 
um, action taken by governments to, to diversify the, the food, the food uh, supply, uh, especially for animal proteins and fats. Second, the selling price of meat in those regions is also much higher than in the US and or in Europe, which are big producers, just because it's imported. And, uh, um, and third, the expected acceptance in Asia is super high. In Singapore, we're also um, opening uh, uh, the, the Thai market. The, the expected acceptance is over 90%. Um, the culinary culture is uh, very uh, diverse and uh, dynamic, and uh, there's much openness for, for novelty in food. Following um, Middle East and Asia, we do intend to launch in the UK, actually, and in the US. Um, the selling price in the US is much lower. Um, the market is much more competitive, um, and uh, um, there are also stronger lobbies <laughs> in the U.S. In the U.K., not as strong, uh, but I think that you know the big, bigger producers like uh, the U.S. Um, require more investment uh, in terms of building it right uh, to be successful. Thank you. I have another question here. I see a lot of hands. Um, hi, Didi. I have two questions. <clears throat> One is. The easier question is: Is there a trade? Uh, is there a taste and texture trade-off mm -hmm. in the cellular meat that you guys are growing versus normal meat? Mm -hmm. One, and then two is: This is a little bit tougher. Um, is w what's your production volume today, and what do the unit economics look like, and what does your production volume need to be for your unit economics to be cheaper or comparable to existing sources of meat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so in terms of the taste and texture, um, cultivated meat incorporates cells from animals, meaning that we have embedded in the product the same volatile compounds and the, the, the fat uh, content uh, which uh, um, actually deliver the, the flavor and the taste of meat and the cooking properties, uh, meaning that we all products um, really connect the consumer to the animal and the meat world and the difference to, let's say, just a, a vegan burger, which sometimes requires a lot of processing to kind of, uh, of uh, uh, replicate uh, uh, this animal world. So we, we can have a higher quality product with much less processing. Um, our first product, as I said, is a hybrid product. We incorporate animal cells into a plant-based uh, uh, matrix. In our first product, we have five or six ingredients all together uh, versus 30 plus for uh, some uh, plant-based products, and again, with a higher quality. The, in the first product, the, the texture primarily comes from the, the plant-based matrix, and the cell provides the, the, the taste, flavor, cooking properties, and um, protein quality. We're working on a range of products, and uh, we'll have, um, you know, again, uh, products in the future where the, the texture comes only from the cells and maybe 100% cells as well. We're not sure it's required, by the way. So that's on, uh, on that front. Texture actually is great. Uh, always juicy, tender, super good. Um, and that's part of our um, uh, unique uh, expertise. Um, on the capacity today, we're operating a pilot facility, which has, you know, as per its name, relatively limited uh, capacity of a um, few tons per year at a full scale. We're currently in the process of moving uh, toward our next phase of, of scale up with a focus on Southeast Asia to start with, uh, with uh, uh, plants with a capacity of uh, hundreds of tons, between 500 and 1,000. And uh, um, when we uh, operate those plants at full capacity, we should uh, reach uh, um, a positive margin and, uh, and break even. So with the, the next plant, we should actually already get to, um, uh, to positive margins. And when we move to what we call our stage three, which is very large scale plants of 10,000 uh, um, uh, tons per year plus, uh, the, the margin will uh, become uh, uh, very high, 57%. Uh, and that's just to <coughs> give one last point on this uh, question. The difference between us, we're a bio-based solution in part of the bioeconomy, biomanufacturing world. The, the cost structure is different from classic food companies. You know, food companies have little economies of scale. There, there are, but limited. And the, the production cost is more or less steady. The, the margins are very small. Um, in our case, um, our cost when we launch at small scale is very high. But then when we increase the scale, the cost goes down 
very steeply with economies of scale, and then we end up with very high margins, which are unseen in the food system. So it's a different uh, uh, paradigm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm interested in the nu nutrient profile of the product, and you already shared that it was high in protein, um, low in calories, low in saturated fat, but do you have any information comparing, comparing that at a, a, um, a deeper level in terms of vitamins, minerals, fat composition, and comparing that to organic grass reared equivalents, mm -hmm. perhaps? Yes, of course. <coughs> We've been working with a um, clinical nutritionist since the very beginning of all developments and uh, uh, driving uh, um, all uh, uh, decisions and, and decision making really around uh, uh, nutrition, nutrition and, and health. So we, we directed our first product, as I said, high protein, low in saturated fat and, and fat. Uh, we also have a higher uh, vitamin B12 content and then conventional meat and we're higher in iron, which are the, the main, uh, let's say, man minerals which are important in meat. Thank you, I have a question. Oh, yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned that it's very important for food, food security to decentralize mm -hmm. yes. our food system, but you also mentioned that you have a partnership with Cargill, mm -hmm. which to me suggests that's rather in conflict with a decentralization mm -hmm. in the future. <laughs> Could you explain, please? Yeah, not necessarily. First, the reason why Cargill is invested in other farms is uh, because they want to diversify their supply. They understand that the current system is fragile. By the way, Cargill has no, board as, no, no seat at our board and is not involved in our decision making, meaning we keep our complete independence versus all those uh, corporate partners. We do believe that we need an ecosystem to drive scale. And that's something which we've seen in many other transformative uh, um, uh, technologies. If you look at uh, renewable energies, for instance, the, the players today who, who are, uh, which are driving renewable energies are the legacy um, energy players, actually. The, the Enel and the um, ex-EDF and the, a lot of the larger um, uh, energy players. You see also that in the um, electric vehicles world, in, you know, Tesla has kind of initiated the transition 15, 20 years ago, but today, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the large uh, car manufacturers in, in Europe and the US are also uh, um, driving a lot of this adoption. So we think that in order to get, to, to, to get a relatively large impact relatively quickly, it's difficult to do it alone as a company. And that's connected to the ability to scale up quickly. I mentioned before the amplitude of the animal protein sector. If we, want, if we want to really drive a real impact on the global level, we need to leverage um, capabilities, both financial and, and uh, operational capabilities of an ecosystem. We need to, to win as an ecosystem and not as a single company. I hope that's clear. I'm giving uh, one more question. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, leaving aside the demand um, profile, what are the biggest barriers for supply for you um, in terms of whether it's permissioning at the federal level, if it's uh, any of the supply chain issues, if it's the biomanufacturing, wh where are the barriers for you to scale? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great question and scale is definitely one of the challenges of um, all the bio-based solutions and we've seen actually um, a lot of other industries and applications uh, being highly successful at very large scale um, and we definitely have the, the tools to, to scale and uh, to large uh, to very large amplitude um, there are some risks associated with the uh, scaling up and it, as I said it, it will take time I think it's important to manage expectations um, in our views some of our peers having to well manage expectations like getting alternative proteins to agriculture in the last few years and I really want to be open and transparent. The potential is, is the same potential, let, let's say, as starting the dairy industry from scratch. I think that the cellular agriculture can be as large as the dairy industry. So it's huge. But it, it requires a fourth time investment. And with this respect, we'll, we've been building for the last few years a, a dedicated upstream supply chain. And we have a, a published agreements with the Thermo Fisher, actually in, in Ireland, um, in the UK, with uh, Vaca in Germany, with Ajinomoto in, in Japan, 
and we're currently negotiating and signing additional agreements to make sure that the upstream supply chain, the input we need, will be available at the cost, quality, and quantities we need to scale. We're relying on uh, external partners for um, the capex investment and for the um, uh, for uh, um, the operational aspect of the scale up. In the first stage, meaning, w I mean, the, the next stage, stage two, relies on contract manufacturing organizations. We have actually agreements with the. Uh, Esquaster in Singapore with the BBJ and Fanbox in Thailand. And we're pursuing similar agreements in, uh, in other countries. Uh, so we, we and, and on the longer term, our model will be to implement uh, um, you know, similar arrangement as uh, let's say um, soda producers like uh, Coca-Cola or even uh, brewer, brewer, brewers like uh, you know, Heineken, Carlsberg, who do rely on local um, bottlers and distribution channels rather than owning the whole operational um, operational uh, supply chain. So we're trying to really make sure that we de-risk as much as possible the, the scale um, as we move forward. I feel there's a lot of appetite for questions. I have two more, if you're okay sure, with that. Oh, I have one here. One <laughs> and then you will have to go see DDA directly, I think. Hi there. Um, you're concentrating on the premium end of the market. Are your production costs the same for lower value cuts or the equivalent of? Mm -hmm. And wouldn't that have the greater impact on the global climate and uh, state of our ecosystems you, if you went for lower cuts that more people could afford? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. The, we're not focusing on uh, high-end products. We start with high-end products because originally we have small quantities, so we can't sell... We can't sell large quantities, and our production costs will be high. And as we scale and drive the costs down, we intend to move toward the mass market. So it's more a matter of a, a staked roadmap. Uh, we, we do have a vision for being a mass market player, for sure. On the other hand, for instance, some of our peers, two of the companies which are cleared in the US are Upside Foods and Good Meat. They focus on, on chicken, like chicken nuggets, which is a commodity product. The commodity products rely on very large quantities and low production costs and low margins. This is not suitable for where we stand in the industry right now. We have small quantities and high production costs. So we, we're not in a position to, uh, to implement a commodity play as of today. We'll be in this, posi in, in this position in uh, eight to 10 years from now. So it, it's a matter of, of uh, instead of scaling up. I think you just answered my question, uh, uh, similar to the previous gentleman. I was, I was going to ask the, the time frame and scale to be able to undercut unsustainable commoditized uh, beef, for example. Eight to ten years, what sort of yeah. scale? I, I think that uh, here again, um, without judging the electric vehicles and their pros and cons, um, I, I see the, the roadmap for cultivated meat quite uh, equivalent. Same as it took, let's say, 15 years plus for electric vehicles to get to 15, 20% market share. Because it takes time to scale up production capacities, build the supply chain upstream, downstream, uh, 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 drive the cost down, and uh, uh, drive mass market products. I believe cultivated meat will follow a similar path. And I believe it will take 15 years to get to 15% market share. But we do see it as an S-curve, meaning that it takes more time. It, it, the, the principle of an S-curve is that it takes the same time to get from 0 to 5% than the, as it takes from 5 to 50%. Uh, so it is the way we look at it. So it's a long-term play, but uh, in terms of investment, if we're here in the investment community, I think that's the time to invest because we're just before the inflection point in terms of valuations. I think that uh, um, there will be some significant value creation in the market when we reach milestones with the uh, market traction, with the, uh, demonstrating our technical economic analysis, our ability to scale. And um, again, if you look at uh, Tesla versus Volkswagen or other large uh, groups, uh, you can see that uh, for transformative uh, products, the inflection points are much earlier on than the actual market share. Thank you, Didier. Um, I will let anybody else that has any more questions. I think we have the room for a little, bu little bit longer. One more. One, one, Didier, you could, okay. One more. Thank you, Didier. Yeah. 
Um, there is increasing uh, research, but also awareness, awareness amongst consumers about eating, in the, about the impact of eating ultra-processed food. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering how you actually fit within those categories, mm -hmm. this category, and if there is any uh, study that you've done on the mm -hmm. impact of eating such products on health, even mm -hmm. though obviously health is a big topic on its own. Yeah, thanks a lot for the question. It's uh, very important and connected also to the, um, uh, to the um, earlier question on the nutrition. Uh, as I said, as, as compared to uh, you know, impossible foods, for instance, or vegan burgers, uh, we have much less ingredients. Our cells are non-genetically engineered and not immortalized, meaning they're the same natural cells or the same genetic material as we eat in our steaks today. And we do see our product as much less processed than uh, plant-based burgers. Um, that being said, it's clear that it's uh, called what we call a novel food. Um, I think that the, the, there may be, you know, on one, on one hand, a cultural shift in education, um, which is primarily with the older generation. I think the younger generation is very open to it. Um, on the pure safety front, we believe that uh, cultivated meat can be can provide a lot of benefits versus conventional meat for a range of reasons. First, it's 100% uh, traceable. Um, traceability is an issue in the meat sector. 100% uh, transparent. When we eat, you know, when we purchase a steak in a, in a grocery store, it's a black box. Black box. We don't know whether the cow, the the, the beef was a, was a sick or not. Whether it got antibiotics. What's the bacterial load on it? In our case, we can uh, deliver full. A set of data and trans transparency about uh, our, our stake. Our cells grow in a sterile environment, meaning completely aseptic. It cannot have any pathogens into it, inherently, meaning no salmonella, no E. coli, no, um, uh, no uh, um, uh, listeria, uh, which uh, can be a great uh, contribution as well. And on top of that, we also avoid um, zoonotic diseases associated with concentrated operations of animal farming. Um, and last but not least, we also avoid the use of antibiotics. Um, as you know, the um, uh, animal um, uh, protein sector is one of the primary drivers of resistance to antibiotics, a big user of antibiotics, even though it's forbidden in many countries, um, which, which is causing the development of antimicrobial resistance, which are a big public, public health issue. Uh, so we, we can help or support um, bringing solutions to all those issues in the food system. So I'm a big believer that cultivated meat um, is uh, actually uh, can have a, a contribution, a highly positive contribution to public health. I'm going to close. I'm really going to close it now. I know. I know. There's so many. We're going to. You're going to have a circle of people around you. I'm fine too. Looking at Rosie all the way in the back. Are we? Can we go for a little bit longer? What, two minutes. Okay, quickly. <laughs> who, fi who needs to go, feel free to. <laughs> I don't, <laughs> don't want to hold anyone. Thank you. Um, sure. I'm just uh, wondering about this huge kind of evil opponent you have on this side, which is the meat industry. And mm. you look at Cargill as an existing partner, in a sense. I am wondering if you are seeing or exploring avenues where a collaboration of ecosystems or partnerships with the people who are in the position to block licenses, approvals, policies, whatever there might be on that side, are you looking at how collaborations and partnerships with them might look like and what a win-win situation there might be? How do you address that? Yeah, sure. That's a great question. Our vision for the food system is to drive a just and inclusive transition of the food system, which requires a high level of uh, coordination between all the players, including the livestock farmers. The, the vision we have for the animal protein sector is, sector is to have less animals better managed in the framework of regenerative organic farming, which is usually a more um, profitable for livestock farmers. Um, and we believe that the, 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 they can, on one hand, benefit from a, a moving away from a concentrated operations, which are not a good solution, not socially, not economically, for a lot of farmers. 
We also believe that we can address a lot of demographic, demographic issues. You know, in, in, um, in the US, for instance, uh, over 60% uh, of the, the farmers, uh, the livestock farmers, need the second job to sustain themselves. The, in France, half of the farmers uh, will get retired in, uh, in the next 10 years. The younger generation doesn't want to be a livestock farmer. And I think that if we look at the dynamics of the sector over the next 10, 20 years, we'll have much less livestock farmers. We'll have less ability to um, produce meat because of the lack of uh, feed, of animal feed, of water, uh, the lack of land, uh, climate change, heat waves. So we, we don't see cultivated meat as a, as a direct competitor to livestock farmers, but rather as a way to support the just transition toward higher value add and higher quality meat, which will benefit the farmers as well. I must say that the livestock farmers are usually open and understand the benefits. And it depends much on uh, some lobbies. I mean, that, that's a complex issue, but the, the meat processors are in favor of it. You know, Cargill is invested, JBS invested, Tazon invested. We have five meat producers at our capital. The education, or let's say the communication, needs primarily to be directed toward livestock farmers so that they, ex they understand what is the opportunity for them. In, s in, uh, in central northern Europe, even in the UK, the, they understand that it's part of a holistic system-based transition of the food system, and that's not directed to push them to unemployment. Um, I think that in the southern part of Europe, Italy, uh, France to a certain extent, where, where the lobbies are very uh, uh, powerful, there are a lot of financial interests and uh, not to make anything change because th there are a lot of subsidies. And I think that one of the big issues for the food system transformation, it's a different topic, it's uh, the subsidies. Uh, today, 500 billion of uh, uh, dollars every year are directed uh, are, um, in subsidies toward um, uh, promoting uh, unsustainable farming practices. We need to reallocate the subsidies to provide the livestock farmer the incentive to be part of this transition rather than uh, to fail the change. Okay, thank you. I think that's the end of our two minutes. Uh, <laughs> thank you all very, very much for coming. And thank you to Didier and to Richard for your time and to all of you for your wonderful questions. And um, I hope to see you all again sometime soon. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.